probably going to, uh, I think uh, we'll finish today with our last of the 2D planar motion coordinate systems we're looking at. We did the Cartesian system. That's uh, very useful uh, in, well, if nothing else, you're used to it. You're familiar with it. You've been using it since, geez, probably fifth grade or something, some of you. Uh, also works particularly well for any problem that just happens to line up with that uh, system, as, uh, as projectile motion does because the, the uh, gravity is all in the y direction. Um, most of the motion uh, is, is from buildings that are in the y direction and downrange targets which are in the x direction. So that works pretty well for those type of things. Then we look at the normal tangential coordinate system. Remember what kind of problems that works particularly well for? If the path is known. Uh, works real well for those type of things. However, uh, as, as we saw, we did a projectile motion problem in the normal tangential coordinate system. Uh, and so the, the problems can be done in any of these. It's just sometimes they turn out to be a little bit easier than others. And we'll look today at uh, the polar coordinate system in 2D motion. Uh, we'll talk about that one uh, just real briefly about what it means in three dimensions. The Cartesian system in three dimensions is, is no great change. You just add on the third dimension, the, the Z direction, and deal with it like that. The normal tangential is kind of also the same. You just add a Z component to it in and out of the plane just like you would with the Cartesian. Polar is a, a little bit different, but uh, we'll, we'll just briefly address it without the, any, great, uh, any great explanation. So the polar coordinate system, oh, and remember, of course, because these are 2D planar motion coordinate systems, each one of them has two variables to describe the location, and then from which changing location we get the velocity and then the acceleration. And of course, the uh, the uh, uh, unit vectors with ij for that. Um, I think we used uh, e n and e t for this one. Uh, and now for the polar coordinate system, it's uh, it's only slightly different um, than the normal. Same kind of idea. So here's some path upon which our object is traveling and it happens to be at some point on that path. The location of that is described as being some distance from some origin, and so we'll call that R, that being some origin O, and then uh, that, that just tells us the distance it was away from the origin, but then in what direction is described by some angle theta measured from some reference direction. And so it looks very much like you might imagine if you were stuck at the North Pole and you were trying to find out where anything else in the world was, you'd say it's so far away and it's in that direction. Uh, so the polar coordinate system then would have um, <coughs> unit vectors for the direction in the r direction there, and then the theta direction, uh, as I drew it with this, would be something like that. And again, these are all orthogonal coordinate systems that we're talking about. So it's uh, the, the actual position vector itself then r would be uh, the magnitude r in the r direction so it sounds kind of simplistic and redundant but that's all the more it is
And then if we give this thing some kind of velocity, remember that's always tangential to the path. So that velocity, well, let's see, let's put the position vector right back up here again, because then the velocity is the time rate of change of that vector. Which will take into account both distance from the origin and direction because it's any change in the position vector. In more simplistic notation, uh, of course, r dot. And then that will be the time rate of change of the vector we just put up there. And that's going to take a little bit of uh, new work on our part. We're going to have to come up with a, a few new concepts we haven't had to uh, mess with before. All right, so we have two things here that are changing with time, or could be changing with time, both the distance from the origin, but also the unit vector itself is changing with time, because if this object's moving along the path, ER at one time is pointing, it's always pointing straight out from the origin, but its direction changes as well because the direction from the origin can change. So this actually has two components to it that we get by the chain rule. R, ER, dot, the time rate of change of the unit vector itself, plus the other half of the chain rule, R dot ER. So that would be a velocity in the radial direction purely a factor of whether it's getting closer to or farther away from the origin as it moves along that path. If we had purely circular motion, <coughs> R would be constant, and then that term would be zero automatically. All right, so we have to evaluate, uh, we have to evaluate this time rate of change of the um, unit vector in the r direction first. So, I'm going to blow it up a little bit so we can see it. There's uh, er, sort of in that same direction I had there. And some little instant in time later, actually let me get that out of the way and put it on top. Some little instant in time later, the unit vector in the r direction is now that way. And there's been some change in the r unit vector. Now that in itself we can look at. Let's see. Uh, that's a vector, so the magnitude of it, the magnitude of that unit vector, uh, well, it's just, uh, since this is very small difference, is really just the arc length that the tip of the unit vector sweeps out. It'll be plenty close enough for us, so that's a, a distance out there times some change in the angle that occurred during that same time. So the arc length, the, the magnitude of this change is going to be uh, r, uh, not r, um, uh, the distance delta theta is the arc length. The distance is 1, that's the unit vector. So this will be 1 del theta, that's the arc length. And uh, so we've got that we've got that piece in the direction of, however, oops, I already took it down in the direction of e theta. So uh, delta e r is delta theta e theta hat. The arc length 
and it's in a direction perpendicular to the direction of the unit vector itself. All right, so we need to uh, figure out just what that is, or, or just what the uh, what the time rate of change of that is now, which will be the limit as delta t goes to zero of this vector over delta t. But that's the same limit of this new part we've got here now, delta theta, delta t in the theta direction. So I figured out what the change in the radial, direct, radial unit vector represents. I need the time rate of change of that. So I divided it by delta t, drive delta t to zero, and then I made my substitution of what the change in the unit vector in the i direction is, which is delta theta uh, in the theta direction. Because now we're almost done. The limit as delta t goes to zero of delta theta over delta t is theta dot. So the time rate of change of the radial vector is equal to the angular velocity in the theta direction. <coughs> and we can then put that together, r theta dot d theta. That's just making the substitution. I already have r making the substitution for the time rate of change of the uh, radial unit vector, and then the second part I don't have to touch. Let's see if this makes any sense by comparing it to the type of thing when we looked at circular motion uh, back in physics one. In circular motion, this uh, in physics one we would not we probably wouldn't use theta dot. What we use for angular velocity? Omega. So this would be r omega. And if it's circular, then the theta direction is the tangential component. So this would be, uh, well, we can just write down that as its direction. You remember that V equals R omega from circular motion when we were looking at that in physics one. And R dot is zero, meaning there's no normal component of the velocity, no radial component of uh, the velocity, in circular motion, it's all um, the same distance from the center of motion at all times, and its velocity at any time is r omega. So that looks very much the same as what we'd seen before with circular motion. Okay, so no tricks there really, but we did have to look at things in a different way than we have before, because we have this time changing unit vector. Alright, so just capturing these things again. R theta dot e theta. All I'm doing is rewriting it so I can kind of uh, build a summary for ourselves as we go. And this last component is only if it's getting nearer or farther from the origin and this is essentially as it's passing across the organ, passing uh, across its this angle of view. All right, so well maybe I'll write down the G 
change in the unit vector because we're going to we're going to need that again. So that was the time rate change of the radial vector was theta dot theta. Just using that piece. Is that right? Okay, so we have the, the position, we have the velocity, which is the time rate of change of the position in the two component directions. Now we need to do the acceleration as well. Acceleration is v dot, so it's d dt of the velocity vector, which I've got here r beta dot b e beta half plus r dot e r. So, if you uh, if you love the chain rule, today's your day. So here we go. First part of this has three parts to it itself. Each of them might have a time variant quality to them. So we're going to have to do the chain rule on that. Uh, R dot on the first one leaves the next two alone. Leave the first one alone. Do the second one. So it's theta double dot. Leave the third one alone. And leave the first two alone and do the time rate of change on the last of the three. That look right for the chain rule on that first part? R theta dot E theta. I didn't miss anything. Looks okay. And then I have this second part, so it becomes R double dot, leave the second part alone, leave the first part alone, and we get uh, ER dot. So I think, think everything's okay. Look all right, everybody? Okay, we can uh, collect a couple light terms. Well, one thing we can do is this very last term here, this time rate of change of the radial vector, we've already got that. We know what that is. So this piece is that theta dot E theta hat. What, is it okay? Yep. Um, one thing we do have that's new is this little piece here, the C e, e theta dot. So we're going to analyze that in just the same way we did with the other one. So uh, imagine we've got uh, some object. There's R, so that establishes for us ER. <coughs> and E theta. And what we want to see is the time rate of change of the theta direction unit vector. So I'll do just what I did last time. Draw a nice big picture so we can see it. There's, there it might be in its original position. A uh, little bit in time later, it's moved around the path some, so now E theta might look something like that with a change between the two. Del E theta right there because of some change in angle. Del theta just like that. I think we're okay. So that, that has 
has magnitude, uh, put a hat on there, that has magnitude of 1, del theta, just like we did before, it's the arc length, but this happens to be in that direction, back towards the origin, so it's made, it's, it as a vector is del theta in the opposite direction of the radial vector, minus e r half. So that's its magnitude, and then its direction is the minus e r, because that's pointing in towards the origin, where the unit vector in the radial direction is away from the origin. And then, let's see, we're over there. We're trying to find the time rate of change of that. So we want the time rate of change of this with the limit as delta t goes to zero of minus delta theta delta t dr. And that's theta dot again. This is minus theta dot e r hat. So that goes, where's that go? That goes right here. Minus theta dot e r. Don't worry, I'm not going to expect you to develop this just, uh, just use it once we've got it. So let's collect uh, like terms, which means group them by unit vector. So that's our data, r dot theta dot e theta plus r theta double dot e theta uh, plus the last one r dot theta dot e theta dot. Oh, but I already have one of those. So I'll just put a 2 in front of it. So I took care of this one. e theta, e theta, e theta. Everybody comfortable so far? And then the two uh, in the radial direction, two components in the radial direction. Oh, wait, this is in the theta direction. Plus the two components in the radial direction. R double dot minus theta dot E R in the R direction. That's beautiful. That's a big chunk of work there already. Let's let's see let's see what it looks like if it looks at all familiar for us. Um, if we're doing circular motion, so R is a constant. This term drops out. We have just R theta double dot. R theta double dot in the theta direction. What did we call theta double dot in circular motion? Called it alpha. Right? So this is just R alpha perpendicular to the radial direction, which is the path. The path is always perpendicular to the radial direction. So that's R alpha, and if R is a constant, we've got R double dot, we have minus theta dot, I lost, I lost an R, didn't I? I think you lost an R squared. Well, let's see, where were they? This is, oh, and I have the ER in there twice, so let's fix this one. Let's fix, this is the R direction, not that one, not that one. Uh, that is a minus sign, so we'll take it second. It's this one, 
R double dot minus, oh, minus R minus R theta dot squared. That's in the R direction. That's better. We would have caught it because it didn't work at all right here. And now it should. All right, so if R is constant, R double dot is 0. We have minus R theta dot squared minus R theta dot squared. But we didn't use our theta dot. We used omega squared. So this is minus r omega squared in the radial direction. Opposite, the radial direction is in towards the center. This is the centripetal acceleration that we always had in circular motion anyway. <coughs> All right, so digest that a second while I reset the taper. And the minus sign means it's towards the center, as centripetal acceleration is, because our radial direction is away from the center, our positive radial direction. Increasing r is why that makes sense. Wow, that's a beautiful piece of work. You guys should be proud of yourselves. So let's... Uh, write it down up here. So then we can clear the board and use all of these pieces in a couple of problems. So I'm just rewriting the acceleration part here so I have all three of them together. parts with our time rate of change of the theta vector, unit vector, as minus theta dot. Do a couple problems. It looks looks a lot worse than it really is. Mostly just because it's new. We have never looked at a time varying unit vector before. That's all a new a new concept for us. But it was pretty straightforward. I hope to figure it out. Uh, the book presents this very same thing only a slightly different way. So. Uh, Either one is fine. All right, so let's do a problem here. All right, imagine we have some tracking radar on the ground, which makes very good use of the polar coordinate system because that origin is fixed and whatever object is being tracked will um, be very much uh, tracked by a change in the angular position. So here's a, a, a plane perhaps we're tracking. It's got some velocity v. It's in level flight. Being tracked by radar. Radar, I don't know if you know this or not, is blue. So being tracked by radar such that it's changing components as it's tracking that. Well, it knows that it's 6,400 feet away. That's just simply the same kind of thing that, uh, that radar does, send out the signal of time, how long it takes to return. R dot, and this it would get from Doppler shift, is 312 
feet per second. Theta at this instant half speed about 40 degrees. Theta dot is minus 0.0309 radians per second. Watch your units here because for angles we need we need those kind of things. R double dot, so the rate in which that velocity signal is, is changing. 9.751. Feet per second squared, 9.751. Yep. And theta double dot. The angular acceleration as that plane is being tracked. 0 0.003807 radians per second squared. All the type of things that uh, that you could read right off the screen of a, a, radio, a, a radar tracking system. All right, so we want to find the velocity and acceleration of the plane. which we get by filling in the velocity and acceleration vectors with all the parts that we know. Great word is that. So the velocity of the plane is r theta dot, r 6400 feet, theta dot is minus What's the minus sign here mean? <coughs> the minus sign on this theta dot the number. The angle's coming towards the ground. Yeah, this, this, if that's theta, as I gave you, then that's decreasing. Is what the minus sign means. Nothing more than that. 0 0.030, no, not 79. squared. That's in the theta direction. Plus the r dot component. 312 feet per second. Sorry, that's not a second squared. That's seconds. And that's in the r direction. And so you work out those numbers. We already we know what the vector looks like because I said it was in level flight. But just to get the numbers to it, um, I believe uh, minus 250 in the theta direction, plus 312 in the radial direction, and that's feet per second. And that's this velocity vector broken into that component and that component. So that's, uh, that's 250 feet per second. This is 312. Notice because of the way theta was drawn, which was a little bit different than the original layout for this problem, it's in uh, actually in the opposite direction of what we had before. How'd you get the theta? Theta? How'd I, is this, this six, the, that's r theta dot, which is the first component here, r theta dot. 
Does that equal 250? 198. Mine was down one line. Oh, I see. No, nope. no. Nope. I think I misread it. Yeah, I did. I'm sorry. It's not 309. It's 39. At least for the numbers I have. But remember, it's just a <coughs> just a problem. acceleration vector in our theta direction and then uh, we'll also sketch that on the uh, on the little picture see what it looks like and again it's a matter of simply taking the acceleration vector and putting in the pieces that we know to r dot, which is the 312. We've already checked the units on everything, so we can be a little more cavalier with it, because we got a lot to write. R, say the double dot, R6400. Uh, say the double dot, the angular acceleration, That's the angular component. And then the, uh, the radial component. The radial acceleration, 9751. Squared, so our thing's working on times theta dot squared. Which we'd need to make sure the units work out. R. Wait a second. Did I do the right one? R double dot minus, oh, no, not quite. Which would be obvious because the units aren't working out. There's R double dot, now I need minus R theta dot squared. Theta dot squared, okay, that's better. And that's in the radial direction. R double dot minus R theta dot squared. Gives us the two acceleration components in the R and the theta direction.
So the acceleration, well, those are both about the same magnitude. So a quick sketch should be pretty easy for us. Um, it's got a little bit in the plus theta direction, which is increasing theta. So maybe something like that. That's A in the theta direction. And about the same component in the R direction. This, this acceleration component in that direction comes because as it's getting farther and farther out, it doesn't have to track an angle as fast. Its, uh, it's angle decreases by somewhat. But it's a matter of taking the, the parts where we're going, and, and these are very easily read right off the screen. For the uh, the uh, right off the screen for the uh, of the tracking station, uh, I'll leave those. We'll need them. If I got it all, Billy, okay, caught up. Yeah. Okay. So we can look at a second problem. But leave that up there because that's the, the whole basis for this uh, polar coordinate system. All right, leave this one for for. Uh, you a little bit. Imagine a robot arm that has something right at the tip of it. Uh, and maybe it's moving apart from one place to another, or maybe it's making a weld in, in some way, but it follows a path that is something like this. R is 1 plus 0.5 cosine theta. So it, distance from the origin, which we'll put right at its own pivot spot as a basis, uh, as a basis for the um, polar coordinate system. And theta is measured from the vertical in this case. So as the angle changes, the distance from the center changes a little bit. So it's certainly not a circular path because it's certainly not constant radius. All right, given these little pieces here, when theta equals 45 degrees, we know that theta dot is 0.6 radians per second. And theta double dot is 0.25 radians per second squared. All right. At, uh, at that point where it's 45 degrees, so about like drawn, find the velocity and the acceleration vectors. In the polar coordinate system we're using. So we've got theta dot, we've got theta double dot, what we don't, and we have R, what we don't have is uh, R dot and R double dot. So where will those come from? From what? 
we've got r. If we derivate once and then twice, we've got r dot and theta dot, uh, r double dot. Just the time derivative of each of those. Don't forget to use the, uh, the chain rule because theta dot as a part of that also changes the time. So this first derivative, uh, that's a constant, minus 0.5 theta dot sine theta, I believe. Does that look right? Did that look okay? Right, and then you can take the uh, derivative of that again to get r double dot. And then all of those we know uh, at a particular theta, so those can all be evaluated. Okay, yeah, I'll set the table. Thanks, Tom. to it. Let's see if we're going to look at the same thing. Bring the minus 0.05 out in front as a constant. Theta double dot sine theta plus theta dot Cosine theta, theta dot squared. Is that right? And yeah, we won't have a minus sign there, so that'll look. That'll look okay. Yeah, not theta double dot. Theta dot. And so those can be evaluated because we know what theta dot, theta double dot are. We know what theta is. So. Like the problem we had before, we now know all of the components of each of those two pieces. So, find those real quick and then uh, we can make a quick sketch of what it looks like actually on the, on the path. I'm not sure just how the path looks with that piece, but we can, we can at least get an idea with it. Make sure that the component directions we've got uh, indicate uh, the kind of thing we've got before. Theta dot is positive, so this angle is growing. We know that it's moving down along the path. So actually, we should have the path. Uh... No, that's okay. The path is getting a little bit closer to R as it theta grows. Because the cosine decreases theta grows to up to 90. All right, so we've got uh, B and uh, R all, A all uh, identifiable with the component parts. Make some sense? See, once we, once we get uh, B and A established after that first half of the class. It's a little bit more straightforward. Phil doing okay? Yes. Alan, all right with this? Yeah. Good. I don't see any tears. I don't hear any whining.
Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. These, are, this is meters. If you put it in feet, that's okay. It's just, uh, just the units change. It's not going to affect the values of the numbers at all. <clears throat> 1.354 meters. R dot, the rate at which it's coming to or away from the center, the origin. I have that as a minus, so yeah, it's actually getting closer to the origin. And the acceleration. Those are the same numbers you guys got on those ones? Bill no, looks okay. And that's just putting the known angle in and the theta dot and the theta double dot are known, just plugging those in. <clears throat> and that gives us everything we need, the six components we need to um, write out the entire velocity and acceleration vector. and the origin are not the same points. No, it should be positive. Right. Because uh, it's moving in the direction of increasing theta. Increasing. Yeah. Because we have a positive theta dot. This is to some established origin and they're not necessarily the same. They would be in circular motion the same, but not in, in ours. Alan, okay? Yep. It's a matter of doing it. Watching your minus signs. Decimal signs. Um, I think it should be the way it looks. No, ER is not negative. ER is always away from the origin. I meant R the velocity. Dot, yeah, okay, yeah. R dot, yeah. R dot's negative. Yeah, we already had that. R dot's negative, so it's. it's uh, its distance from the origin is decreasing, and so it, it does kind of fit the, the picture I've got there of it. And looks like theta dot should be positive, which yeah, that's what I have. 
Question, Alan? Okay. Yeah. I just don't want to keep flipping my pages back to where I wrote those down, so I keep looking at the board. You can't see the board? Do I not write big enough? That's not what I said. I've got all of those formulas written on a couple pages back here. So well, I that's why I put them up there, and then we're going to need them. No, I think it would be good. We have a disagreement on the numbers. Bill, who do you agree with? Chris? No? You guys aren't talking. Man. Stop being a professor and become a divorce lawyer. Yeah, the velocity, that looks right. Acceleration. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Negatives, as always have been, are very important. Negatives and units. Watch them carefully. Chris, Phil, you guys okay? Let's see what we got for the velocity vector. Uh, 812 in the theta direction. Right, Tom? And minus, well, we have just that R dot up there. Minus 0.2121 in the R direction. And that's meters per second. So the loss, then that's that's pretty much what it looks like with my sketch here. So theta component, V theta, and a radial component, not very big, and in the negative direction, so V R. So if we break the, so uh, the, the sketch of the path coming closer as it comes down, it looked pretty good. So nice big drawings help as usual. Not working for the post office. And at that instant, we can come up also with the acceleration vector. 0838 for the theta direction. 0841. 0841. 08. Okay, so maybe a little bit of round off. We'll call it 084. In the theta direction. That's uh, meters per second squared. And then the R direction, 703, something like that. Give or take a little bit. Meters per second squared. And that, yeah, that's negative. So we have an acceleration component, a little bit in the R direction. Very little bit in the theta direction. Oh, no, it's just getting on the MS. You can sketch it over there. Like this? Don't, don't you feel grown up? I told you this was just advanced physics one. This should be called substitution one on one. Yeah. Well, this, this one, it's, it's kind of messy to start it up, get it going, because we have to do those time-changing uh, unit vectors. But once you've got it established, uh, then it's pretty straightforward. It is, you just have to watch your minus signs and your decimals for the most part. All right, so I think you're crying for a problem here of your own, your very own. Actually, I'll save the problem a little bit, just give you a get out of class one, uh, and talk a little bit about three dimensional <coughs> uh, 
coordinate systems, just so you can see them. Just so you've got a, a bit of a picture of them. The, uh, of course, the Cartesian coordinate system is just like it was before, where any point we might locate as a Z component, a Y component, and an X component to it. And then the velocity and acceleration vectors are just time rates of change of any of those components. We did some of those in physics one, so that's not a very great, uh, great departure from what we had before. The uh, normal tangential coordinate system uh, doesn't lend itself quite as well to uh, three dimensions, but the polar coordinate system most certainly does. And I'll tie it to our familiar uh, Cartesian coordinate system just so you can get an eye on it. The polar coordinate system we just established has to do with a point being at some place away from the origin and at some angle as measured from some reference line. So we had coordinates R theta. Then to add a third component to it, we just add a Z component. So if, uh, we have to have uh, three-dimensional space, then we can use the same R theta and then add a Z component to it, and then we can do this very same thing in three-dimensional space. And things don't really change other than the fact that we have on each of these for the position, we'll have as well an, uh, a z component possibly. For the velocity, we'll have z dot. And for the acceleration, we'll have z double, z double dot. So there's not very much more that needs to be done. Uh, the polar system, once done this way, is called cylindrical coordinates because we take the circle that we had in the base plane extend it up in the z direction and we essentially get a, a cylinder that way. So it's not known in three-dimensional space, it's not known as the polar coordinate system, it's known as cylindrical coordinates. And then there's a third one that doesn't uh, lend itself very well at all to two dimensions, and that's uh, spherical coordinates. Again, uh, referring it in some way to the uh, x, y, z plane. Doesn't matter which is which. But now the location of some arbitrary point in three-dimensional space is described with three vectors. The distance from the origin, so we have R as the uh, uh, same as the original component we had before, but then two other angular components. If we drop its shadow down to the X, y, X, Z plane somewhere, we see that the shadow makes a line something like that. So we, that's our first angle, theta. 
the angle the shadow would make in the base plane. Maybe I'll go ahead and draw this in solid. So we're we're trying to locate the point A. And then the third coordinate is this angle down from the uh, vertical direction. Well, I guess that would usually be Z then. Some third angle phi. And so the three coordinates are R, theta, and the angle phi. So it doesn't lend, well, if it's in two dimensions, just R and theta, then we just have the polar coordinate system that we started with. All right, we're not going to do much with that one. It's, it's uh, very, very useful in uh, astronomy, where the uh, observatory itself is at the very center, or if we're talking on greater scale than the Earth uh, center which we all know this Earth is the center of the universe anyway, specifically the United States, for all my foreign listeners. Okay, so one last problem, get out of class question for you. Looks something like this. <coughs> All right, then. we have uh, an arm <coughs> that uh, barely sticks out of out of the uh, maybe a tabletop or something, and then the main bulk of the arm is parallel to that, and it can rotate around this. Uh, part of the arm that's perpendicular to the, uh, to the table. So, maybe we'll call that Z. So as the arm rotates, it rotates in a plane perpendicular to that direction Z is drawn. Now there's a sliding collar on the on the arm whose distance to the uh, base of the arm can change. So we'll locate it with R and that makes some angle with a third dimension theta. such that that angle is changing with time as T cubed radians. Also, its distance from the origin is 100 T squared meters. So find V and A at T equals one second. So back to polar coordinates because this uh, this little collar, whatever it may be, rotates only in a plane. And you can find then uh, all the pieces you need. So what you can find is R, R dot, R theta dot, theta, theta dot, Take a double dot all at one second. And then you can put them all together, get the velocity and acceleration. 
just show me the accelerator, the velocity, and uh, and you can get out of class early. You got seven minutes to cash in on that exciting offer. Mary Anthony, you can do it. parts as you go along, that's fair game. So you've got theta and r that you could find, theta dot, r dot, theta double dot, r double dot, and then put it into the velocity acceleration equation. Trouble, Alan? Get it, Phil?
right? What's your missing Huh? I don't know. Come on, I even gave you one second. It couldn't be easier. Yeah. Be able to do it in your head. Right. Ups and downs. Can't tell. One, three, six. One hundred. Two hundred. Two. And then two hundred. Yeah. That was right. You got one minute, Alan. One minute to fix it. David, you got something? Yeah, I have acceleration, but I'm not sure. That sounds correct. That's the Okay, that's a wrap.